The Angie's List You Know and Trust is now Angie, and we're so much more than just a list. We still connect you with top local pros and show you ratings and reviews, but now we also let you compare upfront prices on hundreds of projects and book a service instantly. We can even handle the rest of your project from start to finish. So remember, Angie's List is now Angie, and we're here to get your job done right. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I, or download the app today. Hi, this is Mark Burgess, and you're listening to the Agile Uprising podcast. Greetings, and welcome to another edition of the Agile Uprising podcast. I'm your uh, this episode's host, Jay Hersko. Joined with me is a good personal friend of mine, software developer extraordinaire, uh, falls into the category of the most bright people I know, one of the most bright people I know, Jonathan Megan. Jonathan, thank you for taking the time. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me at this hour. <laughs> yes, it is quite early, Eastern Standard Time. So uh, this episode is on the topic of promise theory. So some of you may have heard of this. Some of you may be looking at your computer and going, what is this we're actually going to talk about? Uh, so we're going to go in on promise theory. And who better to lead the conversation than the author of the of well, not one, not two, but three books on promise theory, uh, Mark Burgess. Mark, thank you so much for your time. Hey, Jay, thanks very much for uh, inviting me, especially at this early hour. I know you guys had to get up super early for this, so I appreciate it. <laughs> no worries. Uh, a little extra caffeine this early in the day never killed anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark, before we go to Promise Theory, for our listeners that may not be aware of you or know who you are, can you give us a little bit of background? Sure. Where to begin? So I, I, I uh, was raised in captivity as a physicist. I went to university in, to study astrophysics originally. I did a doctorate in theoretical physics, and then um, some years later, I I jumped ship, so to speak, and went into computer science. So as is often the case, when you go to work in a new job, you end up setting up the computers, and um, then you acquire the job of maintaining the computers. And this seemed like fun for a couple of months, and then it didn't seem so like so much fun anymore. So then I started writing some software, which... uh, some of the listeners might know called CF Engine, which was an agent-based um, semi-quasi-intelligent uh, artificial lifestyle kind of agent system to maintain, manage, uh, manage the state of computers. And this kind of turned into, uh, th- this was the beginning of the story of Promise Theory in a, in a way. So, that, so as time went by, I got employed as a, um, first as a lecturer and assistant professor in computer science, and then later I became full professor at the University of Oslo uh, Met. And then I I jumped that ship as well and wandered off into the wilderness to start a company around CF Engine and uh, eventually have become a a traveling salesman consultant, charlatan, snake oil salesman, call, call me what you will. (laughs) Uh, That's one way to lube myself in. I've never heard some willingly refer to themselves as a uh, Charlton snake oil salesman, although Jonathan and I have both come across quite a few in our careers. Um, So Mark, let's, let's start with the, you know, you started as a, you started as a physicist and went into IT, which is completely mind blowing in in, in many ways. Um, Can you talk about the genesis of promise theory? Like what was, what were you doing that kind of sort of stuck in your head that rattled around that led you down this path? Yeah, I mean, it is a pretty interesting story because, uh, as I mentioned to you, I I got this job of, um, uh, there's a little bit of feedback on the line. I don't know if you guys have your your volume up. Maybe turn that down a bit. Uh, Getting a bit of echo. So, yeah, I was, was, um, this story about how I got into managing the computers in Oslo at the university. And... uh, needed some principles to basis. I'm a physicist, right? So I, I, I'm looking for principles to understand how things work and to get some kind of predictability around something. And I wanted to understand how computers worked. And just, you know, the standard story in computer science is that computers do what we tell them. We program them and they simply do what we tell them. And anyone who's worked with computers knows this is uh, uh, 
on a on a fine day, a fair weather day. <laughs> this is uh, optimistic at best to to claim the computers do exactly what we tell them, uh, even with the best of intent. So, so clearly that isn't the answer. And as networks started to become largish, you know, this was the mid '90s, early to mid '90s, and computers were already sort of building up networks around a hundred some even to a thousand at that time, that was a big number back then. Um, the predictability of, com of a single computer is clearly not reflected in a network of a hundred or a thousand computers. So somehow when you put computers together in a large scale, they start to behave like a phenomenon of nature, uh, independent of the individual programming and uh, low level uh, rules or, or biases that we try to instill within them. So I wanted to understand this, and I, my intuition was that physics would be a good approach because you know, centuries of, of practice at trying to describe and understand phenomena. So uh, I went about this uh, in my usual way. And as every physicist would do, I tried to apply common tools, differential equations, um, measurements, quantitative methods, all of that standard stuff that that anyone would sort of jump into with a background in physics. And I made a little bit of progress in that. I ended up writing a couple of books. One was called uh, Principles of Network and System Administration, where, which was pretty much based on hands-on, dirty, getting your hands dirty approach to managing systems and extracting some principles. And the principles are around things like stability, uh, reliability, um, security, uh, things like this. And in a way, it's kind of a best practice approach, which is how most people look at IT even today. But then uh, I was dissatisfied with that, and I started to look at ways of measuring computers, as you would, you know, again, as a physicist, you want to kind of gather data and, and see, if there, if, see if you can even measure phenomena. What can you see in the data? So we started doing a kind of monitoring of all kinds of metrics that you can pick up classic stuff, amount of memory used, amount of CPU time used, how many users and looking at correlations and, and so on. And again, because the network was blowing up at this time, uh, the internet started to spill over into this story. So uh, client server systems, uh, customers arriving to, or customers a bit early for customers back then, but users, of websites starting to come in and, and using services. So all of these things we, we still know and love today were, were sort of fairly nascent at that point. And I started measuring them and we saw some patterns um, and we found a couple of results. One was that when systems are very, very busy, uh, client service systems do exhibit a, a couple of patterns. I think we were the first people to, to notice these patterns of of a kind of a, a peak around midday and a, and a lull during the night, almost a sinusoidal a pattern with a couple of bumps and, and interesting features in, in the way. Um, but when systems are very lightly loaded, there's almost, it's just noise because, you know, when nothing happens, everything is unpredictable. Everything is an anomaly. And so we looked for, as again, in a physics way, we looked for those persistent trends and we looked for the noise or the anomalies related to those. And, and, and sought explanations. And mine, a couple of minor successes around uh, looking at the statistical patterns of these, uh, these um, statistical yeah, patterns uh, around client server systems, it was really pretty lame. <laughs> it was just a shame because, you know, hundreds of years of studying physics and then it all kind of comes to an end when you try to study something man-made. And so I, but I, I worked hard. I, I was putting together a course at the university at this time, master's course in systems. And I wrote another book called Analytical Network and System Administration, which tried to summarize all of these quantitative approaches that I'd used from, from uh, statistics, graph theory, queuing theory, game theory, uh, reliability theory, on and on and on. And having written all this down, I, it kind of clicked for me by the final chapter, what was missing from all of this. And that was intent. You know, the difference between tools and technology and just natural phenomena is that they're built to do something functional. They have a functional purpose. And that 
that constraint was missing from all of the descriptions. And so I went about looking for a way to describe those constraints, what it is that we intend systems to do. How do we explain that, describe it, and then eventually uh, try to bring that back to some kind of semi-quantitative uh, picture of, um, of the system. And, but the new thing there is, is not quantitative, but qualitative. Those qualitative aspects, the interpretation, the, the semantics, if you will, of, of what's going on. Um, and, uh, and that was really the genesis of, of uh, thinking about semantics and qualitative phenomena. And then the final piece of the puzzle was I got roped into a, a project together with the telecom, Norwegian telecom company, Telenor, uh, to design a, a sort of competitive search engine f up against Google using graph theoretical methods. And we came up with some new graph theoretical concepts there. And so I learned a lot about graph theory doing that. And having done that, it, it occurred to me that graph theory was actually the perfect representation for many things that happen in a computer network, obviously. Uh, for, for the listeners who maybe don't know, graphs in mathematics are not histograms and, and curves and the charts you see in marketing diagrams. They, they are networks, basically, with nodes and links between them. A graph is a, is a bunch of nodes with links between them, like a spider's web or a cobweb, of, or like, like the World Wide Web, essentially. So those, putting all of those things together, I started to, to uh, sketch out a picture of interacting systems where a system could be anything from a process to a computer joined together by a network. But the thing I'd learned from the quantitative picture, uh, rambling on about this now, <laughs> but, uh, is that uh, you, you cannot separate what computers do from the influence that humans have upon them. Because basically humans are being driven by their users they are just input output engines and the input heavily constrains what happens in the computer in the most cases, you know, unless it's batch jobs where the, the coupling is light. Certainly interactive usage places a heavy constraint on what computers do and they're being strongly driven. So as a physicist, I'd look at this and I'd say, oh, it's, a, it's a forced harmonic oscillator or it's um, uh, uh, a perturbation of a, of a strongly coupled system of this and that. And you try to model these things, but, but essentially putting all of those pieces together and stirring it in a giant cauldron, uh, uh, since it's Halloween, um, you know, this was, this was kind of the genesis of thinking about uh, computer behavior. And out of that idea came this notion that the idea of promises was actually a, a nice, neat summary of, of this notion of intent, what systems are supposed to do is what they promise. Uh, and we can dig into that a, a little bit, but, but that's kind of how it all came about. That's, that's really fascinating. And so if I, if I understood you correctly, Mark, it really came out to trying to understand the complexity of, for lack of a better term, the ghost in the machine, right? What is the machine doing when it's not being, like you said, heavily utilized? It's trying to put some math around what's going on under the hood. Exactly. Um, and you know, there's this principle in physics which says that uh, if you try to force a system to do something, um, initially you'll, you'll see the effects of that forcing, but over time that tends to, to splay out and disappear as entropy, if you will. It, it gets mixed in with other influences and eventually that signature disappears. So you're kind of interested to know to what extent our hum is an individual's attempt to affect the system important or is it just utterly hopeless you know are we slaves to the machine or ghosts in the machine or simply um, driven by the machine ourselves or do we become part of the machine and the, all of these questions i found kind of interesting and i didn't want to start with assuming the answer because obviously that's wrong in science um, but uh, certainly i've spent the <laughs> the latter 20 years trying to answer some of those questions. Wow, that's, that's really, really wild. So, <clears throat> so Mark, let's, let's go into promise theory as a whole. So um, if you had to explain promise theory as an elevator pitch, which I actually think you kind of got us there, how would, you, how would you summarize it to someone who says, oh, promise theory, what is that? So for our listeners, this is where you want to pay attention and start saying, okay, this is where this episode, I figured out if it's for me or not. Yeah, so the elevator pitch is, I suppose, promise theory is, you would say it's the attempt 
to understand and describe cooperative phenomena at all scales. And it's a, it's a bottom-up approach, it's a local approach as it's in physics. Um, and the starting point is uh, a kind of an algebra of interactions between agents. Everyone, is an a, every, everyone and everything is an agent, whether it's a computer, a machine, a process, uh, a, compu uh, a person, and so on. And the foundations of cooperation lie basically in communication. And the communication used to align systems to a particular common purpose. So, you know, the, so language plays a key role in this, obviously, because communication is important. And again, that tells you that both the dynamics of change, interaction, and the semantics or interpretation of the language are going to play a role in this. So it's an attempt to understand and describe cooperative phenomena, cooperation, if you will. My friend Daniel Mazik, who's also an agile mm -hmm. uh, person you, you may well know, he, like, he, he touts this uh, algebra of cooperation as his, uh, his uh, favorite part. And that's how I actually came across your name. It's through a through a long interview I had with Daniel, where we actually stopped recording and we went just as long as we what we recorded. Him and I were going on and on a lot down the rabbit hole. Um, I really like. Uh, I don't remember which book it was. If it was Thinking and Promises or Promise Theory: Principles and Applications, but there was a, a line you had in there which I thought was really insightful, where it said, "Don't tell me what you're doing. Tell me what you're trying to achieve." And I thought that's really, really powerful, especially for um, those of us in the Agile space. We talk a lot about, you know, sign and sign up and start with why. Um, don't tell me what you're doing behind the scenes. Tell me what the goal you're trying to get to. And I think that lends that, that statement lends that insight into what, how do I start thinking in terms of promises? Yeah, I mean, it, that's, that was a, a kind of a key insight for me early on, because again, this goes back to the, the physics of things. What you try to do in physics is, again, separate time scales, what, what changes very quickly and what changes very slowly in a system. And the things that change slowly, we call those in the invariants because they're more or less constant, but they may be not truly, and nothing's truly invariant, but things may be changing very, very slowly. And the promises that you make about a system, your intentions, hopefully are changing very, very slowly relative to the things you're doing to try to implement them. Because if you imagine designing the keyboard on your computer, you know, if the keys were rearranging themselves in real time, you wouldn't get very far in trying to type on the keyboard. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, so you, you need the keyboard to be a kind of an invariant to keep a promise of its stability for long enough for you to be able to use it in a functional way. And so this notion of separating uh, timescales is, is, is super important. And that's essentially what a promise is. It's a quasi invariant feature of your system. And by identifying those things that, that bring focus to your activities of a long time, you are then able to adapt your, your, uh, your actions, your implementation pathways, if you will. And, and those, those may change for uh, in all kinds of different reasons. You know, your first attempt simply doesn't work. You've, you've got the wrong algorithm or you're, you're, you're suddenly being interrupted by an interference process and noise in the system or whatever. Whatever the reason, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> uh, whatever the reason for that um, disruption, you may have to adapt to your environment because the environment is always impinging upon what's going on, but your promise, you try to keep your promise constant, invariant. And so that, bring, that lends focus to your activities and uh, and hopefully maintains the the outcome delivers on the outcome that you promised awesome so mark let's let's talk a little bit about the the structure uh the, the structure of a promise itself um and, and i liked it there again there was another line in the book that i pulled that i thought was brilliant uh starting with um no agent can make the promise on behalf of another i can't promise what you're going to do i can't promise what jonathan's going to do i can only speak to the me and what i am going to do yes this was this is a funny story around this is I mean again of course we always start with the physics that's me uh, in physics we have this principle called locality which says that uh, things that happen happen close to the body that originates them and things very far away uh, take some time to travel and get closer to you so they don't immediately affect you there's a kind of delay delayed effect so things close to you matter most things far away matter less. Uh, and the the corresponding thing in computers, of course, is that what you 
or, and of people is that what you do yourself affects you immediately. What other people do to you or, or try to influence, bring about an influence upon you is less important uh, unless they have overwhelming force to actually attack you and subdue you and so on. You know, but but in a, in a sort of normal realm of cooperation, uh, agents far away from you, whether people or machines, have less of an impact on you than the things that you promise about your own behavior. So that's one thing. And the other, the funny part of the story is that when, when I was formulating these ideas, I was working at the university. And of course, um, you know, in, in industry, when people try to, to manage computers, they, they do it in an, in, an, in an industrial way, meaning they try to make everything the same. Uh, level the plank, just take a you know a chainsaw to the forest and <laughs> all the trees the same height. Um, but in a university, every child is a special child, and they all want their own special conditions, and they want to do it their way, only their way. Um, you know, with a, a diva singing the song in the background. <laughs> I did it my way, and and academics are like that. They need their own special stuff and. The only way to, to bring about a system with such enormous variation and yet so closely networked together was to uphold this principle of lo locality or autonomy that each in individual agent basically manages itself and may interact with others for some services or whatnot, some delegation, but ultimately every, every agent responsible for itself. And as I thought more and more about this, I realized that this is actually the ground state, the, the starting default state of any system. Uh, without any, anyone else to rely on, you only have yourself to rely on your interior capabilities. And so every agent starts out with a set of its interior capabilities, which we can say are its interior promises, the things it's able to promise to others or offer to others as potentially as a service, whether it wants to or not is a different question, but you know it has the potential to to make certain kinds of promises and everything else is a lie. <laughs> a vicious lie. <laughs> and you, so you talked, you touched on it as um, one of the concepts in your book, which I also felt fascinating was the concept of autonomy where the, you have an, you have an agent, a source agent, right? Someone who's making a promise. You have a promisee who's the recipient agent, uh, the one on the receiving end, obviously there's the body, the body of the promise itself. But the assumption is that the agent making the promise, the source agent is autonomous. And you are, it is a network of autonomous systems all making promises to one another. And that's how you can, using that idea, you can all start to understand the complexity inside the system by looking at if each person is just making a promise to another and you can observe that promise, that's how you get the lay of the land. Precisely. Uh, and if you think about it, this is actually the, the uh, technological version or the, the human computer version of uh, chemistry. We start out with a bunch of atoms, agents in a, a default state of being an independent, individual, self-contained units. They have certain interaction properties showed by the periodic table, if you will, or, uh, you know, they're able to offer certain promises, electrons in the case of chemistry, but in the case of computers, much more complicated services. Um, and then these things can come together depending if they have services that happen to match one another or complement one another, they can join in together into molecules and form a team or an organization, a company, uh, a country, even if you will, uh, with varying levels of, uh, of coupling strength. And the way you then try to, try to command this, uh, this network of interactions and understand its properties as a collective then takes on a new dynamic, which is in principle, independent of, of what happens on a smaller scale. But again, that depends a little bit on the, the nature of the coupling and so on and the scale involved. So if you go back in the history of how, looking at how we try to describe systems, uh, even physics going to the Newtonian age of, which was so incredibly successful at describing the world, it's all based on this notion of, of force, command, obligation, imposing uh, change onto another agent. So a body impacts another body and hits it and strikes it and imparts some force to it. Uh, or I demand that you do this for me, or we impose a law upon you to force you to do this, or I will twist your arm until you do as I say. 
you know, this notion of force is, is somehow built into our psyche, uh, possibly going way back into history around strongman cultures and tribal associations and so on. The history is kind of interesting, but just on an entirely pragmatic uh, level, this, this notion of force dominates our thoughts. And this is the thing that I observed about this was that this picture of force is absolutely wrong. I mean, we've learned in the 20th century that it's wrong in physics. Uh, this came out of the quantum theory. Um, and even before that, it, the, the study of electromagnetism with uh, charges of both positive and negative um, signs showed us that you know, an individual charge by itself does absolutely nothing. It's absolutely impotent. It's only when you put it together with another charge with a similar or opposite sign that something happens. So, so nothing happens by imposition. It's the cooperation, the, the communication between those two things that actually imparts change in, in either one of them. And if you translate this into a more general language and try to strip away all of the uh, special circumstances, you find these very general principles, which I imparted into promise theory. And one is that the ground state of agents is that they're autonomous, i.e. they're causally independent. They, they do what the hell they like um, initially. And then they voluntarily give up part of that freedom by making promises. So instead of imagining that we decide what we want and we shall make this happen, you know, let there be uh, such and such, let there be light, if you will, this kind of deontic uh, impositional approach that we assume we can command the universe. And this goes back, I think, to our, you know, the construction of our bodies. When we want to do something, our brains command our hands and we manipulate things. So we're used to getting our hands dirty and manipulating things, and that's how we view the world. But it's not really, you know, if you try to manipulate a, a, a skyscraper with your hands, you don't get very far, um, or a giant rock. Uh, so there are clearly it's there's some cooperation necessary and scales involved, but so but there is this sense that you know initially we start out independent and then uh, because we are localized and causally independent to begin with we can only promise our own behavior. If we want the cooperation of others, we need their uh, voluntary cooperation as well. We need their participation in that process. So. And that is their independent decision. That's their promise to make. I can promise uh, to offer you a service, but you have to promise to accept it. And so for every offer, there is an acceptance. I call these plus and minus a bit like the charges in electromagnetism I just mentioned, because it's a nice, because uh, then everything, when a, new, when a system's neutral, it's kind of has a binding. And it looks very much like the chem that chemistry that we talked about initially. So yes, as you say, Quite rightly, agents begin autonomously, causally independent, and they voluntarily give up part of that freedom to do whatever they want in order to cooperate with others. So they don't command, they actually constrain their own behaviors in a cooperative sense to lead to that kind of chemistry. And that was, I know we, you and I went back and forth with some, uh, how is this, how is this promise theory applicable to some of the stuff I see in, in, our, in our software world, right? In the agile world. And this is, that's where um, it set my nerd hackles up because I, I think about some of the experiences I've had where say Jonathan and I are working on a project and uh, we have a, um, I'm expecting a service from Jonathan to return some sort of data. Uh, I'm actually imposing on him, you're going to give me a service that gives me X, Y, and Z. And then Jonathan, like you said, he writes it in his own way and it doesn't come back as X, Y, Z. It comes back as Z, Y, X, which results in a defect and all this other stuff. So that idea of, for our listeners, that idea of don't assume, like, and you use the uh, word mark, you use the command or the imposition or even an obligation. Don't assume that if, if we tailor our work in a way where I'm making it uh, an autonomous statement of I am going to do this and then the other receiver can say, okay, well, then I will then accept this. It helps It helps take some of the mis – like, it does, does come down to communication, the miscues, and, and the, I think of the time that Jonathan and I have wasted in our careers just trying to troubleshoot something where I was expecting it in one way and, it, and the end result would realistically be the same if I was open to it, but it came through in something completely different. And that's where a lot of us get hung up over and over again with 
it's words. Just talk to each other and communicate and make that understanding. <laughs> And the thing that I've tried to do, you know, again, because I'm a, um, a theoretician and a, a physicist, I try to formalize this in a way. I mean, you can talk about promises through natural language. Obviously, our natural language is kind of all over the place and, and quite uncertain. There's a lot of freedoms and misunderstandings because it's not very well constrained. But if you want to pin something down to uh, a more predictable outcome, you try to reduce the number of degrees of freedom, the amount of freedom you have. If you can really constrain freedoms to, to a, a bare minimum, then the, the outcome will be far more predictable. And we see this, of course, when we go into a, a fast food restaurant like McDonald's, they will offer you a straight menu of, of highly predictable outcomes, a, a cheeseburger, a, a Big Mac, a, this and that, and, and you pick this thing and it's presumptuously the same every single time and so you know what to expect. They are making a clear promise to you and you are accepting that on that basis. But when we make promises in natural language, oh yeah, sure, I'll do that. And what the heck does that even mean? <laughs> but actually in the human realm, you know, our world is dominated by those kinds of promises, which are, and I think we actually, we actually underestimate just how many promises we actually make in our daily lives on a, on a day-to-day basis. You know, we don't think of, we don't actually use the word promise and we may use the word claim or, or um, offer or advertisement or, you know, any number of variations on this theme, but they are essentially promises, expressions of intent, what I claim I will do to you. And that reminds me of that, uh, I don't know if you guys are Monty Python fans, but there's a fabulous Monty Python sketch called State Your Claim where, where the, 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 it's like a quiz show where people come on the show and they say, stake your claim. And the first one says, yeah, I claim that I can burrow through an elephant. <laughs> uh, and the next person says, yeah, I, we claim that uh, my wife, um, I wrote all of Shakespeare's plays and my wife and I wrote his sonnets, um, which is obvious nonsense. You know, this is, but it's a, pro- these things are promises, right? They, they're actually mm-hmm. promises about what, that agent claims to be able to do. And then it's up to another agent or person, machine, whatever, to assess these things in some way. And this is kind of interesting. The human machine connection has become more interesting now in these days of artificial intelligence, where machine learning is essentially doing the job of sucking in data that ostensibly promise something, but what is it exactly that they promise? We mm-hmm. depends who curated those data and and with which intent, from whom do the data come and how were they selected with which biases and so on and so on. And then how does the machine process accept, promise to accept those data, treat, deal with them, assimil- assimilate them and respond to them and use them? Uh, how is that assessment made and on what basis? And these, these sensitivities to, to the biases and uh, p- peculiarities of agents are now becoming extremely important in this world. And we're only noticing them um, uh, because, because we're attributing them to the machines now. But in fact, in the human realm, it's even worse, right? Because um, people tend to uh, judge situations and make uh, judge. Uh, make judgments and decisions and even govern systems based on a sense of righteousness about what they intended and what everybody else ought to be doing because they did this and that. Instead of looking it through the lens of what, how exactly are they interpreting from their own particular context? What do they understand from this and how can we adapt to that cooperative situation? Uh, just look at politics if you want you know, an example of that. So, so these issues surround us and envelop us in all levels of society and technology, and, and we, can, we totally underestimate the, the importance of these issues. So one of the, first of all, that was very interesting with your connection to politics. Um, on the topic, one of the things that really fascinated me about the notation developed in one of your books for Promises is that it starts and ends with an agent, the notion of the entity which actually can make a promise or receive a promise. Um, It reminded me very much of the actor model. And one of the criticisms that we hear of the actor model is that 
uh, actors and messages and so on and so forth do not compose functionally. Does that mean that there's another type of composition? Uh, and if so, how do you describe and what do you call that kind of composition? Wow. Uh, so <clears throat> for the listeners, I guess, uh, the actor model is a, is a programming model in computer science that is actually very promise theory compatible. It, it's whereas I talk about agents that could be humans or machines, actors in the actor model are software processes, functions or, or machines or entities that can uh, send messages to one another. So the focus in the actor model is, as you point out, um, entities that pass messages. And these messages may be interpreted as uh, commands or promises or services or, or potentially other things, although most things are either uh, an obli- uh, a, a promise or, or uh, an acceptance of something. A message is, is itself a kind of a promise. So then you have to, to, to understand this through the lens of promise theory, um, you see immediately, okay, actors are agents and messages are a kind of promise. Well, the, the willingness to accept a message from another is already a kind of basic promise that actors will make to one another. But of course they could refuse and that would lead you to, to something like security issues, access control, you know, granting access, granting permission. Um, this is another area, by the way, where um, computer science has utterly failed to model security by trying to use uh, deontic logic and, and modal logics and, and the, the concept of imposition, you must do this, you must not do that, uh, which is utterly impossible to impose upon another agent. Agents will do what the heck they like, a priori. Uh, but in promise theory, you turn this around and you understand permissions by as services granted or not granted by the opposite agent. So it's a it's an act of cooperation rather than a, an act of uh, law. The, you know, Moses didn't come come down and smash a, a clay tablet over the, the head of another agent. It, you actually had to ask nicely, would you please grant me this right, or would you would you please deny these rights, and so on. So this 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 notion of causal independence is extremely powerful. It does apply to to the actor model. I. I don't fully, I mean, my friend uh, Jonas Bonner from Lightband, who, who, who was worked a lot on the actor model and is the one of the authors of Akka uh, and Scala, uh, he's very into this actor model and he, he understands this much better than I do. But from my limited understanding of the actor model, it's certainly very compatible with promise theory and the compositionality of it is, is hard to say a lot about because it depends on the scale depends on the particular kind of promises, the particular kind of chemistry. So it's hard to generalize about. Um, in a programming context, things are of course far more constrained than in a this sort of humanic, uh, broader kind of cooperation that we see at the level of humans or biology and more complex systems. But uh, I guess, yeah, it's hard to generalize about compositionality, but I, there are certainly some, some things you can infer from the algebra of cooperation. And there are some things that become quite difficult to make any valid prediction about simply because of the complexity of it. So when you talk about, so I, I'm fascinated that you mentioned, you know, deontic and modal logic. Does that mean that promise theory doesn't map to a modal logic of some sort? Or, or is your implication that because it's a failure in computer science, it's not worth it? Absolutely. This was one of the first things that I studied. In fact, I studied modal logics before coming up with promise theory. It was, it was, that was part of the road to promise theory. And ironically, uh, as, just as I'd come up with the basics of promise theory, I met my now friend and colleague, Jan Bergstra, who wrote, co-wrote the, uh, the first promise theory uh, principles and applications book with me. And he is a logician by background. So he's, He's an authority to be able to say the words that I only intuited. But in his words, after a half century, century of studying deontic logic, uh, this field of, of formal logic has come up with absolutely no results. It's simply gone round in circles, uh, proving pointless theorems that get you absolutely nowhere. And it brings about no predictability because you have no way of knowing whether an obligation will actually be responded to 
because if you start with this understanding of the causal independence of agents, agents do what they like, only what they uh, choose to do on their own, it doesn't matter if somebody tries to say, you'd better do this or else, if you just don't want to, you don't want to. And you might argue that uh, the only sort of human system where people voluntarily uh, choose to act in that way is in say military systems. But this, again, we have to understand military systems as systems in which people have voluntarily subordinated themselves to a uh, superior. They have chosen that role for themselves and they can go AWOL at any time of their own choosing. And the coherence of the system, the predictability of it is entirely reliant on the promises they make, not upon the commands that are issued at the, at the fundamental level. But because you have that freedom in promises, you can simulate some of these deontic models, some of these command-based impositional models using promise theory. So our conclusion was that um, the modal logics are, you know, in the worst case, simply wrong. Uh, in the best case, they can achieve some limited uh, explanations of systems provided you make a lot of assumptions. And promise theory can absolutely represent those. In fact, we show in that in that book with Yang, uh, how to reproduce obligations using promises by voluntary cooperation. So that algebra of, of promises actually will reproduce those things. But uh, some of the properties that are, are claimed about modal logic in order to, to make any progress in the algebra are simply uh, wrong, semantically wrong things, uh, like the idempotence of uh, um, in positions like uh, you must do this and you the fact that you must must do that is the same as that you must do that and it's kind of a semantic nonsense but they have to do this in order to form a, a functional algebra we don't have to assume any of those things in promise theory which i think is is one of the reasons why Jan has actually become a he was quite skeptical in the beginning about promises but he's a complete convert now and and um He's even, he works on many issues of his own using promise theory. So you mentioned military organizations and you mentioned the, cho the choice to be receptive, which is in and of itself a promise as you, as you alluded to. Um, I would ask you then what about consequences and how does promise theory deal with consequences? Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, question uh, consequence. So let, let's try and define what consequences are. Um, a consequence is obviously something related to an outcome. So if we think of the, the, an outcome of a promise, say I promise to feed your cat tomorrow, uh, the outcome of that would be that I either feed your cat tomorrow or I don't feed your cat tomorrow. Um, and you could invent any number of other outcomes like I fed your cat tomorrow, or I stand on my head tomorrow, or um, I buy a dog tomorrow. You can expand the state space of, of the possible outcomes of that promise to any degree that you choose. So there's some freedom there. But if you're trying to focus on this, this very narrow issue of the promise, and you're trying to align around that particular issue, you try to keep the outcomes, space of outcomes fairly simple, like, the promise was kept or the promise wasn't kept, for example. Um, so that's, that's one kind of consequence. You could say that an outcome is a consequence, but the, the consequence is strictly um, uh, an outcome of a process which is based on the guidance of that promise. So associated with any promise is, is a process that actually implements or keeps that promise without the ability to have a process promises would themselves be impotent. I think there would be no way of keeping a promise unless agents had agency. They had uh, the ability to do stuff, right? So, so the, the processes, i.e. things that happen in time and with certain amount of interior resources or capabilities are kind of an assumption behind this idea of an agent that can keep a promise. And this is interesting because this feeds into uh, fundamental descriptions of physics as well. So not only a human being, um, how do I keep my promise to feed your cat, but, but how, does a, how does that electron keep its promise to attract or repel 
another electron, another, another charged particle. How does that even happen? And to, to answer questions of that nature, we have to understand something about the interior properties of those agents, which we may know nothing about. And in a way, I try to avoid that issue altogether in promise theory by saying that agents are opaque. We can't see inside an agent because we just don't know, or we may not know. We may not have access to that. Agents may not be transparent unless they actually promise to reveal that information to us. So again, the idea that you could see into another is kind of an imposition upon their willingness to cooperate. Um, even when we, we go out in public, you know, do we, do we show our faces or do we not show our faces? When you, you go on LinkedIn, do you, do you have a picture? Or do you have an avatar or do you have a, um, a blank screen? You know? And this ability to, to recognize or see into interiors affects things like trust in one another. Do we believe? Um, are we able to make predictions based on promises? Do we trust this other agent to keep its promises? The more we know about agents, the more we've interacted with them and have learned to understand them, the more we tend to uh, trust them and the more effective promises they make tend to be for us. Uh, and the, the less we know about them, the, the less our default trust uh, might be estimated. And the, the number of times we experience that they actually don't keep their promises, then our trust really goes down to, to a low level. And then any promises they make in the future then become quite, um, you know, worthless in a sense. And, and how this scales from the tiniest, you know, level of uh, something like an electron, which we assume doesn't have too much uh, cognitive uh, <laughs> awareness of what's going on, to a, to a cell, to a, an organism, to uh, a team, a company, a country, a world, across these different scales, how we, are, how we assess the capabilities of an agent to keep its promises and the trustworthiness of that affects our ability to assess the likelihood of an outcome. And then consequences, you can, you can build on that, that idea of, of keeping promises to form chains, like delivery chains, end-to-end -end chains of delivery, like um, I, I promise to post this letter to you, uh, but I can't promise that it will arrive because I don't do that myself. I have to in include intermediate agents in that. Now it becomes a cooperative process. And I am totally reliant on the promise by the postman to pick up the, the, the letter to deliver it onto the next one. And the next postman to pick that up without changing my letter and pass that onto the next guy with a, a high fidelity, if you like, without altering the information on the way, without distorting the message or or interfering with it in some way. And then finally, ultimately, it's up to you to accept my message, to pick up the letter and read it. Can't force that, any of that onto you. So when there are intermediate agents involved in, as there are in, in any kind of cooperative system, there are these chains of interaction and consequences are then understood as the, the flow of intent, the propagation of intent along these chains and whether or not the outcome is actually carried with fidelity throughout these systems, these chains. Does that make sense? Yeah, it certainly does. Um, if you will indulge me, just a quick follow-up, because I, I do know that we are coming up on time and want to be respectful. Um, you're talking about promises at a fairly granular level, and even processes that we take for granted now, maybe in a company with dependencies on other team members and then teams with dependencies on other teams, you're, you're talking about something that involves quite a lot of promises. Um, is this, so first of all, the first thing that comes to my mind is something like state space explosion, right? Where you have a whole lot of states which can arrive from a finite state machine or perhaps the Kripke model which arises from that finite state machine and just explodes in size. We talk, we talk about, about a similar phenomenon where there are just way more promises than we realize. So you broke up a bit there at the end, Jonathan. Can you repeat the last part, please? Oh, sorry. I was saying, d does this mean that there are way more promises than we realize or does this simply mean that... Oh, uh, in human systems, absolutely, there are way, way more promises than any of us realizes. 
Um, many of them we simply take for granted. They form this kind of background. Just as we take the environment for granted, the, you know, the fact that we need to breathe oxygen, uh, the fact that the room needs to promise us oxygen to be here is something we totally uh, underestimate or, or neglect to consider because it's not central or germane to the particular focus that we try to, to understand. And you hit the nail on the head at the beginning what you said by talking about granularity because the, the way agents compose into super agents, I call these, you know, collaborations, teams, um, uh, companies, firms, uh, collectives, cartels, you, you name it, any on and on. The way that these agents and super agents collaborate uh, at each new scale, there will be new promises made. So for example, in your company, people may promise not to come to work wearing you know, pop socks or, or something, or, or may, not, may promise not to have garlic in their sandwiches. But at the level of the company, they, the, the company will promise uh, to deliver um, flawlessly um, uh, sculpted uh, figurines or, or uh, whatever the heck they, they promise to sell, you know, I'm, I'm at a loss for examples, you know. But uh, clearly at every new scale, there are new promises that we make. Uh, at the level of uh, an organism, we promise uh, outward capabilities. Yes, I'm a carpenter, I'm a... I'm a, a writer at the level of a team. Yes, we are the development team. We're the management team. The level of a company. Yes, we are the uh, the providers, the service providers. We are the the educational institution. At the level of uh, a county, we are the uh, don't mess with Texas. You know, don't. Uh, we are the, the liberal Democrats, we are the conservative libertarians, we are the, you know, whatever promises at each scale, there are new promises that can be, which represent the, the characteristics, the internally uh, representable characteristics that can be promised to others. So those things change dramatically on different scales. And as you say, as the, as the scale grows and grows, there is this explosion of the number of possible states and outcomes within that. Now, whether or not that matters to the outcome uh, is an extremely interesting question. And this takes us back to the beginning again of, of physics, because this is where physics has taught us that the state space of a system is, is not necessarily represented in the possible outcomes of the system. It depends on the constraints that surround it, the boundary conditions, if you will. And one of the, the, other, one of the other things that Daniel uh, Mezik likes to... Uh, to uh, refer to the promise theory also discusses this notion of boundaries uh, to your granularity question. Where is the actual boundary of a particular process or activity or promise or a collection of agents? Where do, what is the natural boundary of that? So as a, as a human being, is my boundary my skin? You know, if I spit on the floor, is that still part of me or is it no, no longer part of me? It still has my DNA, right? So it's still making some of the same promises that I make, but now I'm, a, I'm more like a slime mold than I was before. My, I become a distributed system by spitting on the floor and, and whatever. Uh, so the, the notion of a boundary has both a physical uh, connotation and a virtual connotation. Again, we see this now. This is coming to bite us again in cloud computing, virtualization of... of computer processes are, is a, is a single computation still a PC on your desk, a single computer, a single CPU, or is it now distributed around the virtual multiverse of computers in the cloud? And where exactly is the boundary? Is it a physical boundary, a virtual boundary? And how do these things interact with one another? Well, again, that question depends a little bit on who's noticing these promises, who is being affected by the promises, and what are they promising to accept or reject about the promises that you are offering. So this highly complex situation, which is exactly the problem which physicists have studied, of course, um, initially in quite constrained systems like Newton and his, his perfect bodies in, in, the, in the theater of uh, Cartesian coordinates, uh, up to modern day thinking about complexity of situations, biological ecosystems, uh, where strong interactions on multiple scales lead to these multi-scale phenomena. 
So this is an extremely important uh, way of focusing attention on scale in systems, in my view, and the way in which physics and computer science really need to get together to solve, well, first of all, to describe and understand, but then ultimately to solve and describe some of these systems. Uh, this year, I give a, since we're at, almost at the end, I give a quick advertisement for my, one of my latest books. <laughs> that was, that was going to be the next section, Mark, um, <laughs> where users can find you, all that sort of stuff. Fantastic. Then I, then I just got it in before you. Um, I, wrote, I wrote a book earlier this year called Smart Space Time. And the, the genesis of that was that I, for years I've been working on this promise theory and applying it to systems. And I've noticed over time just how important the, the notion of space and time are in, and by space I mean the, the freedoms to move around, to change. Uh, in a computer, it could be the memory, you know, the, the amount of memory you have to, to, to do stuff. Um, and time, of course, is how fast things change. How fast is your clock ticking? If you're asleep, obviously you have no time. You don't perceive time. But if you're very busy, you perceive time rather quickly. Uh, and so the relativity of time and, and space is, is an issue which we have assumed was part of physics for the longest time. It's been the domain of physicists. But this is creeping more and more into computer science, especially as we increase the scale of everything and how different scales interact with one another, how an individual tries to command a thousand computers or 10,000 computers, and whether or not that thousand computers actually obeys the command or whether it does something of its own and how that interaction proceeds. Uh, and then again, back to machine learning and all of these different spaces and boundaries between them and the promises they make at the different levels of granularity, all of these are space-time issues that we've studied to death in physics. You know, we have an enormous range of languages and, and tools at our disposal to, to discuss those issues. And I wanted to try to write down some of these things in this book, Smart Space Time. So it's really become, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a large book and it covers a lot of ground, but it really paints a picture of how promises have allowed us to make connections between the most basic things all the way down to quantum gravity and all the way up to the largest scales of the universe. And more importantly, for perhaps for, for our listeners, the human realm in which, uh, which is probably the realm which experiences and exhibits the greatest complexity of all. And that I think is, I can't think of a better way to, to, to close us out. Um, Mark, I, I want to thank you very, very, very much for your time on behalf of Jonathan, myself, on behalf of the Agile Uprising. We will have, for our listeners, we will have gratuitous show notes. We'll link to um, Mark's Twitter. Uh, my alarm is telling me it's now time for me to get up. Um, we will have links to Mark's Twitter, Mark's websites, all of his published work. Um, we, we ask everyone to check it out. We think you'd really enjoy it. So again, uh, Mark, on behalf of the Agile Uprising and Jonathan, I'd like to thank you for joining us. Um, on behalf of myself, Jonathan, I'd like to thank you for getting up at a bit early uh, to co-host with me on this journey uh, for all of our listeners I hope this was an interesting one for you I was going to go back I was thinking I was going to go back to bed and now honestly I think I'm going to walk around the yard for a bit because my brain now is going at a, at a pace I was not expecting um, so once again thank you very much and until next time this is the Agile Uprising Podcast signing out uh, one, time I can't close my eyes I won't break down to break my stride I do it for the view the view by my side the yellow witness the uprise Mazda's most powerful vehicle yet. Craft every detail. A bold sculpted design. An all new inline six turbo. A feeling of everything exactly as it should be. To create more than a car. To create a connection. The first ever three row Mazda CX-90.